I first met Mike and Kathy Hayes. Uh, I guess it was it's it's been over, I guess thirty years since uh, since we met each other, and we've been walking together since that time. And what I can tell you about Pastor Hayes is this: he is a mentor to thousands of us. I, I'm in that I'm in that group. He has been a mentor to me. When you talk to people like Joel Osteen, Robert Morris, others, about who they respect, one of the first names that is going to come out of their mouth is Mike and Kathy Hayes. That's who we look to. And God has given him that authority. Started a church in Carrollton, Texas. That church has grown to many locations and over 14,000 members in the Metroplex. But he's not just been local and translocal. He, he has been international in his scope and his vision. And recently, God spoke to his heart that he was to move to Washington, D.C. He's going to tell you more about that. But he has begun a center for renewal, and it has the markings of literally impacting the future of our nation. There is something happening through this man in Washington, D.C. that I believe has the potential to turn the tide. I could honestly stand here and talk about my friend for another half hour at least without taking a breath. But I want you to hear him because that, that's the magic. That's the glory when you begin to hear him communicate. And I want you right now to give the warmest welcome to a friend of this house and a father in this house, Pastor Mike Hayes. Okay. Thank you, guys. Wow, it's great to be here today. You can be seated. Thank you so much. So nice to see you. I have been here before. You would have to be really old to remember that. It's been about 16 years, so here's the way I feel about that. I either did so well that it took this church 16 years to live it all out, everything I shared, or I did so poorly that it took 16 years to get an invitation back. I don't know. I'm going to take it as I did so good. I made so many friends. Really, by the way, I see a lot of you all here that were here, and you look great. Uh, I'm so proud of you. And, and to the Duran family, that's really a faith dynasty. Uh, I'm so proud of them. Four generations represented here in the house. Great to see mom today. And then this couple, Sarah and... Denny Rodney, who stood up here a while ago, I thought, this is the thought I had. This couple is perfectly suited for this and the next generation. Perfectly suited. So God has done a beautiful thing. Now, D-Rod, I don't know how you talk this girl into it, but just keep smoothing it on. Because you're kind of like your dad and I. We, we're in over our head. Kathy, would you stand? This is my beautiful wife of 45 years. The silver fox, the foxette. And uh, it's so good to, to, to be here with her, and her and I are having the, the time of our lives. Um, I can't, uh, I don't have enough time to uh, talk about my, my love for this family, my respect for your pastors, uh, plural, for... Uh, Pastor Denny and Dianza, our longtime friends, and now this transitional season to their next generation. You know, this is one of God's promises. God started way back in the Old Testament and said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If God can ever get a foothold in three generations, it's unstoppable. A son, a grandson, and a grandfather joined together is, is an unstoppable combination. This is what God is doing. Uh, we founded Covenant Church 40 years ago, last October, 
And on our 40th anniversary, we turned the church to Stephen, our son, and Erica, our daughter-in-law, and they're doing great. Uh, and that released us to fly a little higher over the battlefield. So Kathy and I moved to Washington, D.C. We got a condo there. We opened the Center for National Renewal just two blocks from the Capitol because we feel a convergence is going on that God is calling to D.C. to give us a chance to turn this nation around and touch the world. Now let me give you some good news because you hear a lot of distracting news in the media and you can't pay attention to all of that. Some of it's not even true and some of it's just a distraction but God is using it because there are so many good things going on. Beside just a new presidential administration, please understand this. You'll enjoy this. In the current 115th Congress that is in session, I know it doesn't seem like they're getting a lot done, but there are more good things happening than I have time to describe to you, initiated by the Spirit of God. Why? Because the 115th Congress currently serving has more fired up, spirit-filled Christians in it than any Congress in 125 years. <clears throat> Congresswoman Michelle Bachman told me, who is a fired up Christian, and she said, Mike, when I came to Washington 15 years ago to serve in the Congress from Minnesota, I couldn't find a good enough Bible study or prayer meeting going on in the Capitol to be worth wasting my time. Now there are so many going on, I can't attend half of them because people are praying everywhere. Since the new president took office, and look, I'm not here to defend every tweet and every opinion, but I can tell you you need to be real careful to not catch the distractions and see what's really going on. For instance, President Trump has appointed 124 judges from Gorsuch at the Supreme Court all the way down to the state level that will guarantee godly decisions for the next 50 years, which is an important thing that is going on in our country. Amen? All of them who stand for life and for, and for religious freedom because there's a revival of that breaking out everywhere. Four weeks ago I was invited to northern Iraq. The Kurdish people were going to have a vote for independence. The reason I was invited there was they said come and help us. Think of this. This is an Arab country, newly forming country that you need to pray for. I'm really frustrated right now because Iraq that we spent American blood and billions of dollars is basically Baghdad is already being run by the Iranians. We can hardly get out of town and it's already basically been taken over without a shot. Now the Iraqi army is preparing to attack the Kurdish people in northern Iran. The reason I was in Iraq, the reason I was invited there is the, the Kurdish prime minister said, we want you to help us write our new constitution when we declare independence and we're going to include in our constitution total religious rights for all people and protection for Christians. So think of this. We were there for a week and helped them write into their constitution the first time in history that an Arab country has written into their constitution total liberty and freedom from persecution for all Christians. Their plan is to provide a safe zone for Christians in the Middle East, in all of the other Arab nations, a place to go and live freely as believers in Christ. These are unprecedented days. So I just want to show you a couple of pictures so you'll remember to pray for Kathy and I. First picture, which screen is it coming on? There's me. Okay, I got my Texas Ranger hat on I'm representing. But I'm on the top of our porch on our condo. This is my morning or night view when I go to take my coffee and pray. I'm looking straight at the Capitol. We live on Pennsylvania Avenue. Not a bad address. Second picture is leaving the office after a meeting because this is a meeting I've just finished. And you can see some guys in the Secret Service and an SUV waiting on me at the bottom of the steps. And you, you can see what building we are in. We've just finished a two and a half hour meeting on immigration and health care with the faith leaders team that the administration has invited to the White House and God has favored me to serve on that team. Someone said recently, I can't believe that you would serve and this president and he says things and he tweets and I said, look, would you rather me be across the street throwing rocks or have a seat at the table 
and a place, a voice in his ear to represent and advocate for the kingdom of God. Come on, we got to quit being stupid and start being smart people. And I said to them what I will say to you. If God could put Joseph serving at the right hand of Pharaoh, who was one of the worst despotic leaders that enslaved the Israelites, but God put him in there, I think I can be in there. If God put the great prophet Daniel serving Belshazzar, who was an Assyrian bloodthirsty king, then God can put me there. I'm not making those comparisons to call anybody anything. I'm just telling you that we need to be big enough to realize that all of this that we have prayed for for years is coming to pass. And God is giving us, I believe, God is giving us a three to five year window to turn our country around. That's what I believe. And I believe that's Kathy and I's assignment there. So this final picture I'm just showing just to show you how good looking Kathy is. But this is her and I just leaving a day's work. I never thought I'd be doing this, folks. Forty years I was doing what's happening right here. Pastoring a church, preaching every Sunday morning. And then God has put us in the halls of government. We're just leaving. That's a hall in the Library of Congress. And we just finished a meeting with a strategic meeting with senators there to represent kingdom purpose. That's what we're doing now. And then coming when we can have an opportunity to do what we love the best and be in a church like this with you all. So I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much, Pastor, for the invite. And it's great to be here with you today. I brought, I brought two of the most important books that I've ever done that I want to share with you today. And I'd like to meet you in the lobby afterwards. And if you'd like me to sign one, I'd be honored. This one is called God's Law of First Things, and it's every author's dream. I wrote this book in its first form almost 20 years ago. I've rewritten it to add to it four times, and it's sold over 1.7 million copies around the world in six languages, and it just keeps having a life of its own because it's a revelation that God gave me, and I want you to get it. I'll teach on some of that today, and you'll get the gist. This is a brand new book that's just been out a couple months. And it's based on and tells the story of why I believe God called us to Washington and why he's called you. It's called Influence, Becoming the Leader that Changes the World. It's time for us to lead and not just always follow. We follow Jesus. We lead in the world. And so I want every one of you, this contains, Influence contains what I believe are the top 10 most important leadership strategies for Christians in the earth, whether it be in the marketplace or you leading as a mom or a parent or a CEO, we need to lead by influence. The model is the Apostle Paul. How could the Apostle Paul leave Israel on a slave ship in shackles, headed for Rome to be tried for his life? When he gets there, they lose his paperwork and declare a mistrial. And he says, I think I'll just start a church here in Rome. So he starts a church and four years later, he writes to the church at Thessalonica and says, all of the saints in Rome send you greeting especially Caesar's family. Wait a minute. Here's a guy who arrived in Rome as a prisoner, but the influence of the gospel is so powerful that he has converted and is discipling and has Caesar's family attending his church. So what God wants to do is change the culture by putting the body of Christ in a place of influence. I'll make one last statement about this just for you to marinate in. I love humanitarian missions. And it's not one without the other. But all the body of Christ has done for the last 200 years is mostly humanitarian missions, which is going to third world countries, feeding hungry people, and then preaching them the gospel. Don't quit. Have to do it. It's not one without the other. But we have abandoned influence missions and left cities like Washington, D.C. to whosoever will. Influence Missions is going to the lead, leading cities of the world and impacting the highest level leaders with the gospel. That's how you change the culture. You never change a culture from the bottom up. You always change a culture from the top down. That's why the Apostle Paul started 23 churches in his apostolic career. 18 of them were in the world's leading cultural cities of the day. The Apostle Paul did no humanitarian missions. The only thing you can find in the scripture he did in that way was to raise money from one church to send it to another one that was undergoing great persecution and they needed help. That was his humanitarian missions. But Paul recognized you never change the culture dealing from the bottom up. You have to deal from the top down. And you know what? 
We can't face this with a complex like we can't do this. We can do this. We can do it from the top down, and Jesus will be glorified. Amen? Okay, that's the free part. I'm not charging at all for that part. Tell them how to join. Oh, that's good. Uh, thank you, Pastor Denny. Uh, the Center for National Renewal features four specific things, and the first one is intercession. This is the uh, way that you join our prayer team, and I will send you a weekly update from D.C. and tell you what we're praying about, and you will be joining. Can you believe more than 350,000 people have joined with us since October to pray? Now, this is what's going to make you cry. Of the 350,000, because the Internet is worldwide, right? Of the 350,000, and all you have to do is text the word, sorry, go backwards, guys, text the word Nat Renew for National Renewal to 41411. And when you do that, it opens the page. It, we, you give us your email. We never sell it to anybody. We never bug you. And this is not monetized. In other words, this is not a partner plan. This is a prayer team. This is what's going to make you cry. You know what the largest individual group that have joined up individually but collectively is the largest group of the 350,000? Almost 100,000 on our prayer list praying for our nation are underground Christians in Iran. 100,000 Iranians that love Jesus and have no freedom to meet like we are today are praying for us every day in our country. That touches my heart. Amen. How many of you know we need to pray for our nation? How many of you, just let me take a little informal survey today. How many of you have never visited Washington, D.C.? Hold up your hand. Hold up your hand. Okay, this holds true to what I see everywhere. More than 50% of this audience has never been. So let me encourage you as to why you need to go. Because everywhere in the scripture God deals with the patriarchs, he says, everywhere the soles of your foot walks, I'll give to you. There's something about us going to a place as kingdom believers that helps us with occupancy and dominion spiritually. And Washington, D.C. is a city of beauty and history and warfare because it's an important place. We, are, we have just started, and at the end of November, it may be too late for you this time, but we're going to do it two or three times a year. We're bringing people from churches and their leaders to tour Washington, D.C. four days, and we're going to do stuff nobody gets to do. Like we're going to take you in the Capitol like at 11 o'clock at night when nobody's there. And we're going to go right down on the Senate floor where the State of the Union address is spoken. And we're going to stand behind every senator's desk and pray the kingdom of God over this nation. Amen. We're going to go in the Capitol Rotunda and have a worship service at midnight and declare the glory of the Lord over our nation. So it's not just a historic thing. It's a fun thing. I mean, Kathy and I will be there. How can that not be fun? And it's also a spiritual thing. And here's what I pray, seriously. I pray that God give you, as a believer, an unbelievable hunger and unction in your heart to visit your capital and see what God is doing and give you a vision for praying for our nation. Because we live in the greatest nation of the history of the world, and it didn't get that way accidentally. It got that way by praying people doing the right thing. We live 100 yards in our condo. We live less than 100 yards from the National Archives where the original Constitution, Bill of Rights, and Declaration of Independence sits. Those are, they're not the Bible, but other than that, they are one of the most anointed documents ever written because it has built a nation for the freedom of worshiping Christ that's lasted 250 years and there's no end in sight and no nation in history has ever been able to do that. So thank God for this great nation that God has given us. Can we give the United States of America a nice hand today? We thank God for it. <clears throat> okay. Thank you so much. Let's go right into this word today. Father, I thank you for your anointed scripture, and I thank you that you're going to reveal to our hearts today exactly what you're saying through it. Make it fun, make it receivable, make it digestible, 
and make it life-changing because it's the only book in the world, Father, that the Bible says is alive and energized and sharper than a sword. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me give you what I do with very few teachings. I'm going to start with a disclaimer. And my disclaimer is this. Number one, don't put the slide up yet, guys. Here's my personal disclaimer. This is what I believe and about this message. Number one, we are living in the last days. Number two, you are an expanding, active church. Number three, this word is really only for the serious. Now, I love all of you, but if you're not serious about kingdom things, then just be nice to me and I'll be nice to you, but it's not for you. So don't go and say anything about it because it's only for the serious, for real. Number four, I personally live this word. Kathy and I live this word. Number five, it has the power to totally change your life. Number six, if received, it will release a new season in this church. And number seven, I am not here to gain anything personally. I didn't come here to have an offering received for me. I didn't come here to be given anything. I came here to impart a thing to this house that I believe God has sent in a timely fashion. And it's not going to be a preaching or a teaching. It's going to be an impartation. And an impartation is a giving out, and then it's up to you to receive that. And if you receive that, there's going to be miracles that are going to happen. Unbelievable things are going to happen starting today in this place. And we just declare that over you today in Jesus' name. And I pray that if there is any spirit that would put any kind of, you know, spirits do lots of different things. And I'm not a spooky guy and I don't see devils behind every bush. I see two. But anyway, uh, I'm not paranoid. But spirits can take the best people who have the great, greatest kingdom potential and in an atmosphere like this morning can put like a spirit of boredom or cynicism or deafness on you and you miss the word that God had for you that would change your life. And I say that with no personal ego involved. I'm just, I'm just a messenger today, but I want you to receive an impartation. I want to talk to you today about radical generosity and three ways to get there. You get there by radical revelation, radical obedience, and radical discipline. In their book, God and Money, How We Discovered True Riches at Harvard Business School, this was not a church book, by the way. John Cortinas and Gregory Baumer revealed a telling giving demographic in America. So we're going to start with this, and I'm not going to bore you with demographics, but I want you to see something that's really important to me. Let's look at this graphic. This was a survey taken one year ago in America. This is a brand new book written from Harvard Business School. Look at the statistics because they're actually encouraging. I'm actually going to fire you up with these boring statistics. Watch this. Look. Number one category, the average American last year gave less than 3% to all charitable organizations, including church, Red Cross, everybody. Less than 3%. So quit with the griping already about the church only wants my money. If they do, the church must be really disappointed because they're not getting much of it. Less than 3%. Look at this. Wealthy Americans less than 3%. So nothing changed in the average American just because they had a lot of money. They, they didn't give any more of it than the average person. Number three, quotes, in quotes, Christian Americans, still less than 3% of their total income. So a nominal Christian experience saying I'm a Christian means I go to church on Christmas and Easter, that nothing changed about their giving. Category number four, now we're gonna see a jump. Church-going Amer Christian Americans, just people that regularly go to church, 
give five to eight percent of their income. So there is a jump when there's a meaningful experience with Christ. Look at the last category, and this is the one I want for all of us. Wealthy, devoted, fired up church going Christians more than 10% of their income, many of them averaging more than 50%. David Green, who is a friend of mine, who is the founder of Hobby Lobby and a multi-billion dollar company, corporation, who is just completing one of their little projects they decided to do with some of their leftover money. They spent over a billion dollars, two blocks from our condo, And next week, the Museum of the Bible opens in Washington, D.C. Do you realize this? There has never been... Listen to this. This is mind-blowing. There has never been anywhere in the world a museum built to the Bible till now. They have more than 500,000 artifacts dating back even to the Dead Sea Scrolls. They've spent over a billion dollars on biblical artifacts and a building that you wouldn't believe that's gonna open next week in the nation's capital, a a museum of the Bible. Here's what David Green said. He said, my family and I was sitting around many years ago talking about wanting to really be generous. They started a little picture frame company in his garage. And and they're, they're godly people, they're praying people. His wife is an intercessor who spends several hours a day crawled up under her husband's desk praying for their company. And in their family discussion, they said this, we've always, one of the sons said, I think it was Steve, Dad, we've always heard the saying, you can't outgive God. Has anybody ever really tried to see whether or not that's a true statement? Let's try. So dad said, okay, we already tithe 10% of all of our profits. Let's double them. And let's double that every year so that unless this statement is true, that's not possible because by about year five, we will be broke unless God makes that word true. So when David told me, he said, now 18 years later, we have proven that you can't outgive God because we double our giving percentage every year and God doubles the company. You can't outgive God. So the reason I'm encouraged by this statistic is because ladies and gentlemen, and I want you to get this in your spirit, this is what is proven by this statistic. Fired up in love with Jesus, Christians give it if they have it. If they don't have it, they don't give it. And it's not because they don't want to. It's because they don't have it to give. So here's what I want to do. This is why I told you I was talking to the serious. I want to get unbelievable, unlimited resources available to you because I believe if you have it, you'll give it. So that's where we're going. God is calling kings, kings in the marketplace. The radical revelation that we're going to talk about today, I'm going to share with you quickly, and we're going to kind of add to it layer by layer from the Word of God. First verse we read, Psalms chapter 112, verse 1. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commandments. His descendants will be mighty on the earth. Let me ask you a question. How many of you in this room have children or grandchildren or both? Hold up your hand. That's your descendants. Keep your hand up if you want your descendants to be mighty in the earth. I heard a man recently say to me, I started out with nothing and came up the hard way, and that's the same way I want my kids to come up. That's the stupidest statement I've ever heard. What you want to do is raise great kids who don't have to start at ground zero, but can take what you've been able to amass in your lifetime and go further than you could ever have gone. Kathy and I drove into the Dallas area in 1976 with $200 in our checking account, a wore out deuce and a quarter Buick, and a five by eight U-Haul with everything we owned in it. Last October, I turned over to Steve and our son, the next generation, five campuses, almost no debt, 
and $55 million in a physical property asset. Now what Stephen's gonna be able to do at 33 years old is start not where I did, but start with where Kathy and I finished our pastoral ministry and go further into the future than I could ever go starting at zero. How stupid is that to want to start over every generation at zero? We're never going to get where God wants us to be starting over every generation. So we want our descendants to be mighty in the earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Look at this last line. Wealth and riches will be in his house. Now, that's what I preach, and I want to clarify something, and I'm maybe only answering for a couple of the cynical that might be in the room, but this is for everybody. I want you to get this. And for those of you who are sincere, you need this information. I am not a per se prosperity gospel preacher. I am also not a poverty gospel preacher. Poverty gospel was begun several hundred years ago, teaching that the poorer you were, the holier you were, and they actually had their priests, their ministers, take a vow of poverty that they still live by today. They have to die with nothing. I don't believe in that. I also don't believe in the prosperity gospel that's just kind of a blab it and grab it kind of thing, and if you believe this, you're going to get four Rolls Royces in your garage. I don't care about that, and I don't think God does. This is what I teach. I teach a sufficiency gospel, which means that I believe that God is obligated to supply for me everything I need to fulfill what he called me to do. How cruel would this be for God to call us to do something and then never give us the resources? I believe whatever God has called you, whatever your dreams are, whatever he put in you, God will help you succeed to a level that will help you pay for what he's called you to do. That's the sufficiency gospel. Does that make sense to you? It does to me. So Matthew chapter 6 verse 33 says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, this is Jesus speaking, and all these things shall be added to you. I want you you've heard that verse before, but I want you to get this really clearly in your spirit and don't ever forget it. Seeking the kingdom first will always bring us the things we need for our lives. But seeking things first will never bring you the kingdom. It will always lead you away. So if things matter more than the kingdom, then if you seek things, you'll never find the kingdom. If you seek the kingdom, God will add you the things you need. That's the formula. So let's jump into this. Exodus chapter number 13, verses 1 and 2, God is going to build by layers what we call his principles of first things. Exodus 13, God is laying down the instruction for how the children of Israel are going to function and how this is all going to work. Because they came out of Egypt, remember, with nothing. So see, this is the book of Exodus, which means they are just now making their exit from Egypt. They have nothing. God says, children, do it like this, and you'll have all you need. Verse number 1 and 2 in Exodus 13. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Consecrate or set apart to, uh, to me all the firstborn, whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and beast, shout it with me, it is mine. Let's say it again. It is mine. So what is the declaration that God makes right here? He says, every firstborn of your flocks, every firstborn is mine. Now, in Exodus 13, 11, if you drop down further in that chapter, God says, and it shall be when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, as he swore to you and your fathers, and gives it to you, that you shall set apart to the Lord all that open the womb, that is, Every firstborn that comes from an animal which you have, watch the second layer now. The first layer is every firstborn. The second layer now is every male shall be the Lord's. But every firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. If you will not redeem it, then you shall break its neck. And all the firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. Now, let me explain this verse. God has nothing against donkeys. But what have we learned so far? 
God says, every firstborn animal on your farm is mine. Bring it to be sacrificed. But he said, if you have a firstborn donkey, don't bring that to be sacrificed. I'll explain that to you in a minute. But he says, if you will not redeem it, this, ladies and gentlemen, is the first place in the Bible that one of the greatest words that's ever used in the concept of the Bible, redeem, or redemption, which means to buy back from, this is the first scripture where that word is used. So he says, if you have a donkey born on your farm, don't sacrifice that. I don't want a donkey sacrificed. It's not one of the sacrifice animals. You can trade it, redeem it with a lamb, and if you will not redeem it, then break its neck. As cruel as that sounds, what is God saying? God is saying, if you have a firstborn thing in your life, like a donkey, but it isn't a sacrifice animal, then trade it for one that is. So you redeem the donkey by bringing a lamb in its place, sacrifice that to me, then the donkey is paid for. Now, enjoy the donkey as your beast of burden on your farm. He can carry loads. He can take you to town. He's going to give you many years of good service. But if you don't redeem him, and he was first born, and he's a male, you stole him from me. And he won't be a blessing to your life. You would be better off to break his neck. Now, why did God say that? Very interesting. Let's add one more layer. He says in the last verse, verse number 14, And this is as big as anything I'm going to say today because this changes everything about our mentality of giving. Watch this. So it shall be, God says. So it shall be when your son asks you in time to come saying, what is this? In other words, God is very practical. So God knew that what was going to happen when I met this morning for the first time this beautiful baby that they call Doc. Okay? Okay. Here's what's going to happen. Let's put Denny Rodney back in Jewish time here, and he's learning these laws. So in their, on their little Israeli farm, they're raising sheep. And they have one born that's like born the same day as the baby. And so he becomes his pet. He's this little white, curly-haired, fuzzy animal that's his best buddy. But he's a firstborn male of that flock. And so when he's a couple years old... Dad explains to the son, son, listen, and he's got a name, and I know he's your buddy, but he goes to Jesus. We're going to sacrifice him. So God knew that you were going to have to explain to your children this sacrifice system. Now watch this. God says, in times to come, when your son asks you, Dad, why do we do this? Why do we give? I'm going to give you an answer that not one in 10,000 Christians in America knows. Well, we give because we built this new building and we got a payment. Not that. Well, we give because we've got, I mean, they don't give us the electricity around here. The church has to pay a light bill too. It's not why we give. Well, we have this school and we got some student. No, that's not why we give. Well, we got a pastoral staff and we love our pastors and they have to be paid. And the Bible says to muzzle not the oxen. We, no, that's, not, that's not why we give. This is the first place where it's clearest and cleanest why we give. Son, here's why we give. Because we were slaves in Egypt. And God delivered us with a mighty hand. And we made a promise from then on that we would remember that he brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. With an annual gift of our firstborn lamb. That's why we give. Now watch this. If we ever taint that reason, then we raise a generation of people who don't get it. Then you get into churches full of people who think they can buy favor and they, well, I'll help you if you help me and you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. And how much do you need, preacher, for that new building? And all of our giving becomes all prostituted with a mixed up amalgamation of all the wrong reasons. And the bottom line is, if I had time, I'd want to sit down with every one of you in this room today and say, tell me your story about where your family was before Jesus came into your life. 
And that's where you'd be if it wasn't for him. So that's why we give. When we do that holy thing of dropping some of our money in the offering, it really has nothing to do with money. It's because God delivered me and I'll always put him first in my life. Now, so we can say, pastors, team, administrators, do whatever you need to do with the money, but that's not why I gave the money. Build buildings and pay light bills and hire staff and do all that, but that's not why we gave it. We gave it because he brought us out of bondage. When I think about my family, I'm the first generation raised most of my life as a Christian. My parents weren't saved till I was two years old. They'd never been in a church till the day they got married. My family in Ohio were service station workers and coal miners and simple salt of the earth people, nice people, but filled with troubles, uh, addictions, divorce. My grandparents were the first divorced people I ever knew. People in the 50s didn't divorce. My grandparents divorced and remarried each other three times because of PTSD and World War II and alcoholism and destruction and division and brokenness and sickness and disease and poverty. My mother moved to 18 different houses in four years trying to raise her three siblings while her mom worked three jobs. That's where I was. And then Jesus came in our family. And when Pastor Denny introduces me and talks about 14,000 people attending a church today in Dallas that God used us to build, I look around and I, I think he must be talking about somebody else. Because you've got to understand that I understand where God brought me from. And that's why I'm happy to give. Because he brought me out of Egypt. Where was your Egypt? What would you look like if there was no Jesus in your family? That's why we give. So Numbers chapter 18 adds another layer. Look, verse 15 says, Everything that opens the womb of all flesh which they bring to the Lord, whether man or beast, shall be yours. Nevertheless, the firstborn of man you shall surely redeem, because God has never been for human sacrifice. And the firstborn of unclean animals you shall redeem. Now, here's the added layer. Because he hasn't said this till now. That's why we didn't understand about the donkey. Now we're going to understand. God designates animals clean or unclean. Not based on their barnyard smells. But based on being chosen for sacrifices. They are the clean. All other animals are unclean. Watch. But the firstborn of a cow. The firstborn of a sheep or the firstborn of a goat, you shall not redeem. They are holy. You shall sprinkle their blood on the altar and burn their fat as an offering made by fire for a sweet smell to the Lord. So here's what we've learned from these verses. Firstborn, male, cow, sheep, or goat is always the Lord's. It cannot be redeemed. Firstborn donkey, horse, cannot be sacrificed. Has to be redeemed. Let's move forward for a minute into the New Testament. God wants to save the world, and so he designs a beautiful plan to have a son. So the Holy Spirit overshadows a virgin, and at Bethlehem, in a month and a half or so, we will celebrate the birth of Jesus. So God had a son, firstborn, male. Let's see if God lives by his own law. So Jesus is growing up. He's never ministered. He's never healed. He's never taught. According to the rabbinical uh, 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 tradition, he is now 30 years old which is time for him to make his spiritual move. So he has a cousin, John the Baptist, who is having great baptismal services down at the Jordan, baptizing hundreds. Jesus goes down to check it out. I can picture it this way. John is down there in the Jordan in the water. John was a rough guy, lived in the wilderness. He was like the Bear grills of the Bible. And he's got this beard and he eats locusts and wild honey. 
and he's baptizing people and people are rejoicing and Jesus walks up and he's standing in the back of the crowd like this watching. He's so proud of John and John sees him. He looks up and he's just raised a lady up out of the water and he's like, whoa, I lost one, go get her. And he sees Jesus and he points and Jesus sees him, smiles real big, gives him a thumbs up. Great job, John. We'll go out afterwards. I'd like to catch up with you. Great. John goes back to baptizing. Jesus is watching. And the Bible says that a prophetic unction came on John because Jesus said there was never a greater prophet than John the Baptist. So John is baptizing and the Holy Spirit comes on John as a prophet. And the Bible says that he spins around and points his finger at Jesus, who's in the back of the crowd, and no, most people haven't recognized him, and he's never even started his ministry. And John shouts with prophetic, prophetic vehemence, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. When John made that statement as a prophet, he sealed Jesus' fate. He's firstborn. He's male. He's a lamb. He could not be redeemed. He had to be sacrificed. Because God lives by his own law. So, the day that Jesus died on a cross is the day the Father paid his first fruits offering. This is my firstborn son. He's the Lamb of God. He cannot be redeemed. He has to be sacrificed. But the law was, if you give the firstborn, all that come thereafter are blessed. That's why, ladies and gentlemen, everything changes at the cross. You can't judge anything or build any doctrine for our salvation out of the old covenant. Because when Jesus died on the cross, the old co covenant rule of the first fruits was everything that comes thereafter is blessed. So everybody you meet now, you can appropriately prophesy to any little waitress or wait person that helps you when you leave for lunch today and say, listen, I see something unbelievably special on your life. And you'll never meet a person that that word is not true for. And usually when I tell one of them that, tears pop out of their eyes. And the first word they say to me is, really? Because most of the people in this city have never had a man or woman of God look at them and say, I see something so special on your life. And when they hear that, they can't help it. They're going to start crying and they're going to say, Really? I started that at one of the restaurants Kathy and I love by our house. And we worked our way from the wait staff all the way up through to the manager and the owner. And we have to start over now. Because every one of them has gotten saved, come to our church. And now they've moved off into their own restaurants, businesses, CEOs of this leaders of that because there's nothing more powerful than this revelation not just for you but it frees you to look in the face of any man woman or boy or girl and say there is something so special on your life why because Jesus was the firstborn sacrifice of God and everything that comes thereafter is blessed released from the curse and blessed to become everything God called us to be I'm going to have a 30-second altar call right now. Every head in the building bowed, every eye closed. I'm going to ask you, if you're in this room, whether it's the first time or the tenth time, it doesn't matter to me. I want you to raise your hand right now if you can say, I want to become everything that God has called me to be because I believe Jesus' death on the cross opened that opportunity for me, and I'm not a fool. I'm going to step right into that. Hold up your hand. You don't have to raise your eyes. You can look down. You can keep your head down. You can do whatever you want, but raise that hand. Father, in the name of Jesus, Every hand that's raised right now are men and women that you died for and love. 
And I pray in Jesus' name that you give them the strength, the anointing to become everything you've called them to be in Jesus' name. And we thank you for it. Amen. Come on, let's give everybody that raised their hand a good, a good, a good hand clap. Okay? Now, let's shift quickly, and, and I'm going to bring this all together for you. In Malachi chapter 3, we know about the scriptures about the tithe. How did first fruits become a tithe? Here's how it did. First fruits became a tithe this way. When all of the children of Israel quit living on farms, and they were not agrarian anymore, but they were building great cities, the city of Jerusalem in Jesus' day had a half a million inhabitants. It was a big city. So most people there didn't have sheep. They were bankers and lawyers and doing all the things that we all do in big cities. So the law accommodated that by shifting from sheep sacrifices to shekels. The Israeli money still to this day, we call ours a dollar. Israel calls theirs a shekel. Shekels are denominations of money. So God shifted from sheep to shekels. And in Malachi chapter 3, you know this passage, but I'm going to give you a new revelation about it that you've never heard. Revel uh, Malachi chapter 3 says, bring all the tithe. Tithe simply means a tenth. Bring all the tithe into the storehouse so that there is meat in my house. That's the old translation. The new translation says, so that my house is strong. How many of you want to see all of us give so that our house of God is strong? We don't want our house of God to be weak and in debt and in trouble and can't pay the bills. We want our house strong. So he says, bring the tithe into the storehouse that there may be food or strength in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Now, I want to do something with you here just for a minute. I promise you, if you don't learn something new in this sermon today, you get a full refund for everything you gave. So here's one thing right now you're going to get new. I'm going to change this verse a little bit, and I'm not going to change its meaning. But I'm going to teach you something that I'm sure you know, but I'm going to refresh you. When the Bible was translated from Aramaic or Hebrew in the Old Testament and Greek in the New Testament, the translators, in order to be authentic to the words that they were translating, had to adjust the language of it so that every phrase made sense. How many of you understand when you directly translate another language, it doesn't always make sense in English? Like, for instance, I study Spanish. Well, Spanish phrases are backward to ours. If you translate them exactly, then it's backwards. So you have to translate it by changing it and add a word or two. It doesn't change the meaning. That's what happened in this verse, but I'm going to do something for you. If you were looking at this like one of those old-fashioned people with a Bible with pages and actual paper, remember those days before smartphones and iPads? Okay, then the translators of the Scripture italicized the words that they added. Does that make sense? You know italicized words, the, the font changes? So they italicized them to let you know what they added. Watch this. I'm going to read this verse removing the italicized words, just like it's written in the original Hebrew. Here's what it would say. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house, and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open windows heaven, that not enough. All those other words were added. There's nothing in the original text that says uh, windows of heaven then pour you out so much blessing there's not room to receive it. Those words aren't in there. I just gave you the words. I'll open windows heaven, that not enough. But I love that. You know why I love that? Because the second part is accurate to exactly what is said in the original text. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. See, I think we've emphasized the wrong thing. I think with the translation written as it was, we emphasize the there's something you can do and when you give, God's going to open windows of heaven and you're going to be so blessed you can't even contain it all. Well, I don't know anybody like that. I've been really blessed and I tithed, but I've been able to contain most of mine. It doesn't say you won't be able to contain it. It says something even better than that. I will open windows of heaven over you and pour out blessing, but that's not enough. 
I will also rebuke the devourer off your life. Now, here's two things that I want for this house today. Two things. I'll take these two. This will be good enough. If we can do this today, we'll settle that it was a good Sunday. I want you to walk out of this room today living under open heavens and the devourer rebuked off your life. The devourer in this verse is the same word in Exodus used, destroyer, that they put blood on the doorpost. We know who the devourer is. We know who the destroyer is. The Bible says that Jesus came for this one reason. So that the devourer that is our enemy, would be rebuked. Now, I want to talk to you about rebuke for a moment, and then I'm going to do that here, and I'm going to give you a chance to receive that by the Spirit. The word rebuke in the New Testament, and Jesus used it often, Satan, the Lord, rebuke you. The term rebuke means, when translated, stop, get back, that's enough. That's what it means. It doesn't mean I'm going to kill the devil, because God's using the devil. He's still got purpose for him. He sorts out the men from the boys, I can tell you that. So let's do this. If you want open heavens over your life, what's that worth? And if you want the devourer that has come to destroy you and your offspring rebuked, that's a good deal, right? What would you give for that? I'd give anything. I'd give anything physically possible to live under open heavens and for God to say to the devourer that has attacked my life, this is what God says. This is what rebuke means. God raises his hand to the devourer that has attacked you and your family and says to that spirit, stop, get back, that's enough. I want that. I want that. Because listen, if God is pouring blessings in from heaven on your life, but the devourer is still eating them up as fast as you, then what kind of life is that? You can't enjoy God's blessing with the devourer destroying everything around you that you love. What if you had a horrible choice you had to make? I'll give you $100 million, but I'll take your kids. What kind of deal is that? I don't want that deal. I want Jesus, I don't need any more finance than I need to accomplish everything you call me to do. And I want the devil rebuked off of my kids. I want my heritage to be mighty in the earth. How many of you will take those two things? Hold up your hand right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, we're asking you for two simple things right now from this verse. We're going to ask you to open the heavens over our life and ask you to rebuke the devourer. And in Jesus' name, while your hands are raised, we're going to do that right now. It's one thing to talk about something. It's another thing to do it. This, this is what takes the spiritual impetus and the anointing that God sent me here on this beautiful assignment to be with you today to do. Right now, in the name of Jesus, we say to the enemy that has come against you and your life and your children, your family, your business, in Jesus' name, stop, get back, that's enough. Stop, get back, that's enough. Some of you are going to get phone calls before this day is over with somebody coming home because the enemy's got to stop and get back, that's enough. Let's give the Lord a good hand clap right now. Can we? Come on. So now, do we have the commitment, the discipline to, to make a once for all time decision that no matter what, the first fruits of all my increase is given to Jesus through the conduit of my church. My tithe goes to Jesus before it goes to the bank. Where did I learn that? I learned that in Hebrews 7 and 8. Before this service is over, I'm sure we'll receive our tithe and offering. I want to tell you some good news. Here's how it works. Look at Hebrews 7. Hebrews 7 is the greatest explanation in the Bible of the ministry of Melchizedek, which is the priesthood anointing of Jesus. The Bible says that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for you and I. He is our faithful high priest. That's Jesus' office. That's where he sits right now. Look at this. So many people miss this. 
Look at Hebrews 7 and 8. Here, in Shreveport Community Church, here, mortal men receive tithe. That means when we receive the offering here in a little bit, some men and women are going to pass some buckets, and they're, they're mortal men, just mortals. Here, mortal men receive tithes, but there, he receives them. What does that mean? He's talking about the heavenly priesthood ministry of Jesus who is seated at the right hand of the Father. I'm going to tell you as literally as I've ever told you anything. When you put your tithe in the offering plate at your church, before the church takes it to the bank this afternoon or tomorrow to be processed in, the angels have already borne it to heaven and it goes to our faithful high priest who holds it up to the Father and says, Look, Father, at the faithfulness of your children. Plan a week of blessing and covering and protection for them because they are tithers. Before it goes to the bank, it goes before the Father. That's what it says. Here mortal men receive it, but there he receives them. And this is the biggest part of all of whom it is witnessed that he lives. Now, I could preach on that for three weeks because what that literally means is when you take the first portion of your increase and give it to Jesus, it is the greatest witness in the earth that he is alive. Now, I don't say this part to shame you, but I want to be a voice to challenge the body of Christ. I am truthfully sick and tired of this less than 3% number living in the greatest nation in the history of the world, and we are so dang stingy that we can't find a way to give the kingdom of God more than 3% of everything God gives us. That's shameful. And you know what that does? That's a laugh in the face of God, and demons howl. These people are a bunch of idiots. They accept the blood of Jesus to forgive their sins, and God blesses them and gets the devil off their back, and then they go out and get the best job they've ever had in their life and rob God regularly by forgetting him, and you got to you got to preach to them and beg them and treat them nice and serve them free coffee for them to even come to give anything. And the reason they're supposed to give is because their God brought them out of Egypt with a mighty hand. But we got to be reconvinced every Sunday of another reason why we ought to give away with that. Let me tell you something and the pastors can straighten out my bad ideas after I leave. I would trade today in the body of Christ. Please hear this, coming from 45 years of experience. I would trade every building program, every special missions push, every peanut brittle sale. I would trade it all for a church full of people, 100% of whom simply tithe the first portion of all their increase. Because Jesus saved them with a mighty hand. I'd trade all the programs. A few years ago, I was meeting with a fundraiser. There are professional fundraisers in the body of Christ, and they're good people. I like them. But I met with one at our church with our team. We needed to raise a few million dollars for a building we were building, and we met with him. He was a nice man. But he said, you know, what I'm going to need is I'm going to do this program for you. And we're going to meet with your people and we're going to make brochures and we're going to show them what you're going to build and we're going to sit with them in their living room, your biggest givers. We'll sit with them in their living room and drink coffee and we'll tell them why they need to support this. And I need, I need a deposit on what I'm going to do for you. I need the first 200000 that you will raise when we start raising money, but I need a check up front for 200000 for for my part, and I'm going to start building a beautiful brochure, and you give me the list of names, and I'm going to go sit down with your biggest funders in the church, and I'm going to talk them into giving a lot of money to help you build this building. And I'm like, you know what? You are a nice guy, but this doesn't work for me. That $200,000 I'm going to write you a check for, I know how that comes in in this church. We've got hundreds of single moms trying to feed three kids. And their little wrinkled $20 bill 
that they turn in this week, which is their first fruits of all they earned, and they had to iron clothes and babysit somebody else's kids to make $200, and their tithe is $20, and I'm going to give the first 200000 to you to help talk those people into giving to build a church we're building for them. I'm sorry, I'm sure you're a nice guy and your company is A+, plus, but I'm not hiring you. Something really wrong about that. Because when we as the body of Christ know who we are and where we came from and why we give, I don't need some, I don't need some slickster from New York City or wherever he's from to come into my congregation and talk my people into why they ought to give to help me build my building. It ain't about me and my building anyway. And if the people I'm preaching to don't get it, they don't need a new building. Why fill up a bigger building with more people that are just like them? If the people that are already here don't believe in the vision enough to give, and we got to re-talk you into it every Sunday, how, could you, how long could you run a good marriage like that? Come on, wives, are you with me now? How long would you enjoy living with that man that you're sitting with today if you had to talk him into staying with you every week? And you're like, man, what happened to that vow? What happened to that vow? You stood at an altar and you looked in my eyes and we repeated the words of a pastor and you said to me, for better or worse or richer or poor or sickness or health until death parts us. I'm going to be faithful to you and you alone and all others I turn my back on. It's you, baby. It's all about you. And that's for life. We can make a vow like that, that I believe God stands behind and helps us because he's all about that. But we can't make a vow with our increase to say, Jesus, because of what you've done for me, I'm a kingdom guy. And you don't have to talk me into it every Sunday. When it's a good Sunday or a medium Sunday. When it's an awesome sermon or a sermon not so great. We all have bad days. When it's a day that the sun's shining and when it's a day that it's cold and I'm in a bad mood, you're still first. And I'll never have to be convinced of that again. Life is pretty simple. Jesus, you're first. And the first portion of all my increase the rest of my life is yours. Let me close with an illustration and then I'm going to pray for you. Thank you for your attentiveness, by the way. Let me show you some pictures I took. Just for this day, I took a picture here of 10 dimes. This represents the whole amount of our increase. Maybe your increase this week was 100, 1,000, 100,000, a million. It doesn't matter. Divided into 10 parts. One of those 10 dimes, let's just say that's my increase this week. One of those 10 dimes is God's. I'm going to answer a question that not one in 10,000 Christians in America knows the answer to. I'm going to give you the answer today. One of those is God's. There it is. I marked it red, just like with the blood of Jesus. One out of 10 is God's. So I'm going to make a choice in my life. I'm going to choose to put God first in my finance, so I'm going to put it at the head of the line. God is first in my life. When I give God the first one, I have nine more left and all of them are blessed. Let me tell you something straight up today with all the love of God I feel in my heart. If you can't make it on nine-tenths of everything that you earn and it's blessed, you can't make it on ten-tenths without God's blessing. So I decide to put God first, so I give it. I set it up above because it goes to heaven. The part that goes to heaven, that part right there. See that single dime at the top? See what we have left right below it? We have nine more just like it and all of them blessed. But what's the first one doing? Can I tell you this for just a moment? Can I just dream with you for a minute, body of Christ? If we could move that first number I showed you when I started a few minutes ago today on that statistical reality that is currently less than 3%, if every one of the 250 million professing Christians in America would just tithe, we would build schools for every church with free tuition through the 12th grade, 
and then we would build first-class Christian colleges where every student went for free. We would have our, home, our own health insurance that could be cashed in at our own hospitals. The body of Christ started off in this country building our greatest universities and hospitals. Why? Because everybody took seriously the tithe and there was more than enough to do all the work of God. Now the smarter we get and the fancier we get, we've got to have new rabbits to pull out of the hat every week to convince somebody to give what was already God's in the first place. And you remember what God said about that donkey? He said a word I didn't emphasize then, I'll emphasize now. If you will not give it, break its neck. It has to do with the will. If you will not, then you might as well break its neck because it's not going to be a blessing in your life because it's mine. That first tenth ought to be building the kingdom of God. You would never have to have a special missionary offering because there would be more than enough. Schools, build all the schools you want. Buildings, no debt. Education, health care, covered because every Christian tithes. It would be an almost unlimited number. But we don't believe that. We don't trust that. We're game players. I'm talking about the overall body of Christ. Pardon me, I've got a nationwide vision going on right now. We're liars. We say Jesus is first and we love him. We don't. It shows in our checkbook. We love everything and everybody but Jesus. Jesus gets regularly forgotten. We intended to give something, but we just paid all of our bills and there wasn't enough left. Sorry. And pastor, I know you're never going to challenge me on this because I got to pay my bills. You know what? When this gets really a hold of you, what it's really all about, you'd rather skip your electric bill and sit at home in the dark and bring your first fruits to God than to pay your electric bill and rob God and give him nothing. Listen, folks, I'm not going to be easy on you because this is a world-class church, and I believe you can step up to the challenge. We can do better than we're doing. We can do better than we're doing. We're going to do better than we're doing. We're going to start doing it. There are some lions. There are some lion-hearted winners. Right now, your, your pulse has increased a little bit, and there's a little bead of sweat that's popped out on your temple because you know that you are a lion-hearted warrior for the kingdom of God, and you've been sitting around, messing around, and get involved in church scuttlebutt and politics that don't amount to anything, and God called you when he saved you to be a world changer. What are you doing messing around? in the mediocre. God called you to be a world changer. This is a world class church. We're going to step up to the line. We can do what God's called us to do. So let me finish quickly before I pray for you and just tell you a simple story. You know the stories. I'm going to apply it to giving by law which many of us do. Sadly, most. What do I need to do? Is somebody looking? Is somebody going to come to my house and sit with me? I guess I've got to. Somebody, are we going to publish this list? I guess somebody's going to find out what I give, so I ought to do more than I do. All of that stuff. Okay, here's what happens. The Bible says Jesus was walking one day in the streets after he started his ministry. And watch this. A guy who had it all. Look at the, look at the uh, description of this guy. A rich young ruler he had it all he had youth he had authority and he had money but he wasn't sure about his salvation because the precious Jewish people through trying to live by the law they have 16 they have 613 laws till this day that the Jews try to live by and and this is their testimony I love them I have a special calling to them I spend time in Jerusalem all the time listen to this one of the greatest rabbis that ever lived, that is revered by every Jew in the world, passed away recently, and on his deathbed, his last statements to those with him was, I'm not sure that I am acceptable in eternity to God. You can be the best of the best trying to live by the laws and never sure that you're good enough. So this guy was rich, young, and a ruler, he slipped up to Jesus by night and he said, listen, how do I know that I have eternal life? And Jesus 
believe me, Jesus knew what his demon was, but he didn't start there. Jesus said, well, son, um, keep the law. Listen to this now. He's better than most of us. You don't lie to Jesus. He said, sir, this I have done. I've kept all the law from my youth. Which means that he gave approximately 43% of his income because that was the law's requirements for all the tithe and the sacrifices and the first fruits and on and on. It amounted to about 43% of his income. I've done that from my youth. And I'm still rich, but I'm not sure I'm saved. And Jesus said, I know your real issue, son. You love your money. So do this, and you'll be sure. Sell everything you have and give it all away and follow me. And the Bible says the rich young ruler shook his head, thought it over, and walked away full of sorrow. Can't do that, Jesus. Which shows me something really dangerous. You can be a church-going, believing person and doing the minimums and still have something so a hold of you that Jesus is not Lord of your life. And if he ever touches that, don't force me, Jesus, because I will walk away on you because you're not getting all my stuff. Well, guess what? On your last day, when we have a slow driving and a sad singing that is called your funeral, you're taking none of it with you because it was God's before we got it, and it'll be God's after we're finished with it. We're only stewards of what is God's, and it honors him. It makes him cry. When you give your tithe, you remind the Father of the day he paid his, and it honors Jesus, and it's proof that he lives. So let me tell you a victorious story before we pray. The rich young ruler is not a good story. It's a guy who failed, and we don't ever hear another word from him because Jesus wasn't worth his money. Sorry, Jesus, I really like what you have to say, but if it's going to take that, I'm going to have to walk away. And you can be attending every Sunday, and still in your spirit you've walked away. But there was another guy, one of the worst little guys in the New Testament. You've heard of him. Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a little short guy. Everybody in the town hated his guts because he was Jewish, but he was a traitor. He had sold out to the Roman government and took a job as a tax collector, collecting from his Jewish uh, family and friends for the Romans. And he was really good at it. In fact, the Bible says he was the chief of tax collectors, which means he was over all the other tax collectors. And he had a lot of money, and he was a thief and a liar. And he lived in this village, and Jesus came there to teach. And the Bible says this guy wanted to get a, a seat to get close and see about this Jesus guy. So you know the story. He climbs up in a sycamore tree so he'll have a better view, and he hears Jesus teach. Now watch what happens. Jesus has a call on this disgusting little guy's life that everybody hates, but Jesus has a call on his life. He has a call on his life. That's why he's hungry. So here's what happens. Jesus finishes teaching. And he starts through the crowd, and he stops right under Zacchaeus' tree and invites himself home for dinner with this guy at his house. And the people in the crowd just suck air. Can you believe Jesus must not know who he's talking to? Oh, yeah, he knows. So Zacchaeus comes shuffling down out of the tree, stands in front of Jesus. He's like down here. And Jesus says, we're going to your house today for lunch. And Zacchaeus says, okay. So he goes, he gets the servants going. They get a beautiful meal. Jesus sits down with him. They recline at lunch. They're talking. Watch this now. There is no mention in any of that story about Jesus ever mentioning money. But Zacchaeus falls in love with Jesus. And Jesus changes his heart. And there's never an offering taken. And when Zacchaeus stands up, tears on his face, this is the first thing he says to Jesus. Half of all the money I have, I'm giving to you today. 
and everybody that I've ever stolen from or dealt with dishonestly, I'm going to repay them four times over. That's what I call giving by grace. If you ever fall in love with Jesus, that doesn't have to be a rule. Nobody twists your arm. We don't have to pay somebody from Madison Avenue with a slick program and give them the first 200 grand to help us build a building. We're just in love with Jesus. And the first portion of everything I earn from this day forward is yours, Jesus. And I hate to even ask, but can you just review for me what I get for that? Okay, well, you get this deep, settled peace that your eternity is good. And secondly, you get open heavens over your life. And thirdly, I'm going to rebuke the devourer off of you and your family so that you live with more joy than you can ever imagine. And you don't spend all your time in hospital waiting rooms or unemployment lines because I take good care of my kids that put me first. You can't outgive me. If you think you can't afford it, you're a slave to what you own. And it really owns you. So give it up. Come out with your hands up. Make a vow to me today. Listen, here's the beauty of grace. In grace, we never go back. God doesn't keep a record of your yesterday. In grace, we come out with our hands up on this October Sunday and we say the rest of my life just like I made a vow to be married to you my spouse that I love I make a sacred vow between me and my Savior the rest of my life the first portion is yours I know what it means you paid your tithe God when Jesus was given on the cross firstborn male lamb So the first dime of every dollar I earn the rest of my life is yours. And you know what? You don't have to make any rules about that. And the preacher doesn't have to preach a house of fire to talk me into it. And you don't have to have a special campaign with a four-color glossy brochure and a special meeting at my house. We don't have to drink coffee together and you get on my good side so I can feel really big and make you feel really little. In fact, I'd like to make you beg because I secretly hate all this anyway. That's what you get into with church junk. Just wash all that stuff away and say, listen, I'm going to go back to the simple reality that I can't even imagine where I would be if he wasn't in my life. And this is all he's asking for, for all that he's given me. Are you kidding me? So just like, a, just like a snake peels its skin every spring in the spirit, I'm just asking God to peel this old layer off of us and for scales to fall from our eyes. And listen, I'm not afraid, and it's not here anyway because we've taken authority over it, but I'm not one bit afraid or intimidated by the two or three cynical who think that I'm preaching this because it's all about money. Listen, I told you in my disclaimer, I didn't come here to take anything from you. God is good to Kathy and I. I'm not rich because I don't want to be. But we live a great life and we don't have one penny of debt. Our home in Dallas is paid for. Our condo in D.C. is paid for. Our vehicles we drive are paid for. And we're not rich, but we believe in the sufficiency gospel. Everything God calls me to do, he pays for it because I did it by his call. So my goal is not to die rich and then let my kids fight over it. My goal is to fulfill everything God called me to do in my days and then turn it to the next generation and everything that's left is still going to be used to glorify God. And I don't do everything right, but listen, I got this down because I'm not a fool. And my opinion is for what Jesus has done for me, if he's not worth a vow from my heart, that the first dime of every dollar from this day forward is the sign of my love for you. And it's not because it's a law. It's because I get to do it. And you can't beat God giving. I wonder how many in this room 
would accept this word and say, you know what? I'm in. We could make this a six-week seminar and beat around the bush, but the bottom line is you've laid it out here. I get it, and I'm in. God brought me out of Egypt with a mighty hand, and the rest of my life belongs to God. So you say, well, I can give 10%. No, I'm not talking about 10th right now. I'm talking about 100%. I'm 100% in. Everything I have is God's. I don't have any agenda other than God. I don't have a plan for my life other than God. Thank you for joining us. We hope this message has equipped and encouraged you. For current events and other resources, visit ccpeople.com. And remember, the best is yet to come.